Okay, let's run. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations. Welcome to And I Quote, the weekly show where we introduce you to content creators of all shapes and sizes that join us from many and all corners of the nerd universe. We find out more about them by taking your questions. I am your host, Ryan of Neuroculture, and our guest on this episode is someone who's been a part of the comic book community and the industry for over four decades. He is a, He's not just a man. He is a legend in his own right. Please welcome Mr. Mark wade mark welcome to the program how are you good sir good thank you i think the word you're looking for was icon i think that was the word you're looking for yes yes that is actually the word i was looking for you corrected me uh very much so and i'm fine with that it's all good sometimes i make a mistake here once in a blue moon all good okay but yes an icon you are and we thank you for being with us now if you have any questions for the one known as mark wade please let us know in the comments let us know in the chat be more than happy to Take those as they come in. Our producer is going to be monitoring it as we go throughout the course of this program. With any further ado, Mark, how were you introduced to the world of comics? Ah, it was 1966. It was when the Batman TV show came on the air. I was, you know, three years old. But even then, I was entranced. And my dad saw this, and he remembered liking comics when he was a kid, and came home with this, a Batman comic of the era. And that was just it. That would that opened the gateway for me, and I never stopped reading. Fantastic, fantastic. What would you say are, were some of your favorite comic book writers or artists growing up? Growing up, I mean, it, it because DC and well, I, I wasn't reading Marvel comics when I was growing up in the seventies, in the sixties, because I lived in the rural South, and there really just was no distribution for that stuff. You couldn't find Marvel comics, but. So I was a DC fan through and through, and they didn't run credits. So I just kind of knew what I liked and didn't like, didn't have names attached, until Neil Adams came along. And then Neil was the first artist who I looked at and said, I want to follow that, that artist. I, that blows my mind. Uh, and to this day, he's, he remains one of my favorite artists of all time. Uh, that was, you know, when I was a kid, as I got into my teenage years, in the early 70s, that was when Marvel did this renaissance where the first generation of comics writers who weren't Stan or weren't Roy trying to sound like Stan came along. And that was Steve Englehart, Jim Starlin, Steve Gerber, uh, those those sort of cosmic-oriented uh, writers or, or offbeat humor writers like Gerber was. That was my jam. Back then, I was reading Defenders was my favorite comic of the 70s uh, with a run of Englehart Avengers that's also my favorite single story of the, the Celestial Madonna stuff is my favorite Marvel story of all time. Um, and that was the stuff I was reading back then. And then, you know, as I get older, it's George Perez, it's Marv Wolfman, it's, you know, Paul Levitz, it's Keith Giffen. So, you know, I've always had my eye on certain creators, but the ones I really learn the most from and and feel most attached to are those early 70s creators that i that i latched onto. incredible names there incredible names to be sure and what would you say are some of your favorite comic book based movies or tv series past or present i gotta tell you doom patrol rocks doom patrol is just full stop the best dc superhero show of the last few years uh and it, it breaks my heart that it wraps up today with the last episode um but I love the, f the first few seasons of Flash I loved. Uh, I really dug Batman Brave and the Bold. I was watching episodes of that again last night. It's just so much fun to see a Batman team-up series. Um, what else? I got, um, I, you know, of the, of the stuff that is theatrical, I mean, Superman the movie is the all-time favorite for me. Uh, I, I didn't love the first Keaton Batman movie at the time, but I've come around 
because at that time it was just it was so far afield from what I knew of Batman. He was, you know, he was much darker and much, much grimmer in that in that movie. But I've come around, um, and I like that movie quite a bit. Uh, and in more recent years, you know, a lot of the Marvel stuff has been great. Avengers Endgame was mind blowing. Uh, the part there was a everybody remembers there was a scene where Captain America catches Thor's hammer. And I, I went to the movie, I went to the, we went to a special screening for the Marvel guys. So we were, you know, so we're all together in there. And so the energy is different than it would be for a regular audience, right? We're all super pumped. It's like the Super Bowl for us. And when that fight was going on, we were all losing our minds going nuts. And when Cap caught Thor's hammer, it was the most joyous moment. And I just went berserk with excitement. And only after the the movie was over, the lights came up, the credits started to roll, that I looked down and realized I had literally ripped the arm rest off the chair that I was sitting in. I was so excited. I took that home, by the way. I snuck the, the arm rest home. It still sits on a shelf right now to remind me how much I love that moment of that movie. Oh, my gosh. Yep. Talk about a souvenir for the ages, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. That is just fantastic thank you for uh, sharing that with us do greatly appreciate it. yeah that's that's being being in a crowded theater with fans of certain properties and they and, or they're just in the, in the in the mood for a great film and you're sitting there with them and you see all these great moments come up and you got people fist pumping in the air and just cheering and hollering it's a great communal experience yeah. so i totally agree with you on that we do have some questions coming in from our friends here in the chat i'm going to bring these up here so so <laughs> So Din uh, asks, uh, Mark, do you prefer the JLA and the JSA on what is known as the same Earth or different Earths? I prefer them on different Earths because to me, I like on the JLA Earth for Superman to be the first superhero. That makes sense to me. It, I mean, it's very fitting. Uh, on both Earth 1 and Earth 2, they would, Superman would have been the first superhero. But if you want you combine the JLA and the JSA on one world there's some fun generational stuff you can do. And I love having Jay Garrick around, but at the same time that makes Superman a latecomer to the game. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I can understand that. Good stuff. And funny. It's crazy. We talk about this character a number of times, but apparently they have a username on YouTube known as Kal-El asks. Okay. <laughs> Kal-El yeah. of all people. Uh, he asks, uh, Mr. Wade, do you plan to write more solo Superman comics after last days of Lex Luthor? I would love to see you writing an ongoing series. I, I do. We are, I was working on some stuff just before we began broadcasting here. Um, no, no announcements yet, but sharp-eyed readers who have been following certain comics, I've, uh, other comics I've been writing, might be able to key into what's happening next. Excellent little teaser, Smithers. Yeah. Very excellent. Uh, Dave Manley goes on to say, I was already loving the movie Avengers Endgame, but when Cap caught the hammer, I kept a crazy grin for the rest of that battle sequence. Yep. yep. I cannot remember being that excited in a movie theater since Christopher Reeve caught Lois Lane in a helicopter. Wow. That's going back. Yeah. It's going back a few. Just just, just a few. Mm -hmm. Awesome sauce. So when did you decide to become a writer? It was very late in the game. I had no ambition about being a comic book writer, actually. I wanted to be a comic book editor because I honestly didn't think you could come up with that many ideas all the time. I thought that would be an impossible task. And you know, I, I didn't want to be an artist because I didn't practice as a kid. It was just too labor intensive for me. And as a writer, I'd written lots of nonfiction. I'd written a lot for fanzines. I'd written a lot for, you know, college newspapers and that sort of thing. I went to school originally as a journalism major, but I didn't have any experience really writing much fiction. And then when I became an editor at DC Comics, uh, what that meant was I was working with every writer in the field. Right? They were, all these scripts were coming across my desk, especially because I was working on anthology books. So scripts from everybody, from Neil Gaiman to John Ostrander to Christopher Priest to you know Len Wein to Marv Wolf, all these scripts are coming across my desk. And reading that stuff, digesting that stuff, looking at it from an editorial point of view, I learned so much more about writing in that brief period of time as, as a, about two years as an editor than I could have in decades on my own, I think. And so coming out of that, 
I left editorial. I needed a job, uh, and I kind of knew the characters. I dabbled with a couple of shorter stories over the years, but I didn't really anticipate it being a career. But it just sort of fell into a career. It seems to have worked out okay. It's amazing how things turn out. Yeah. You know, it, it really is. And what else is amazing is that this is an incredible episode known as And I Quote with our guest, legendary and yes, icon, huh. comic book writer, it's extraordinaire, Mr. Mark Wade. Uh, don't forget to like and share this with everyone you know. If you have any questions for Mark Wade, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. If this is your first time here, welcome. And we thank you for being with us. What would you say are some of the rewards about being a comic book writer? It's the immediacy with which you get to see your work in print and gets a response to it is is paramount because any other medium you're working on if you're working on a film it's going to be a couple of years before your work comes out and it's going to be dabbled with by everybody at the studio who has an opinion you know and much the same for television uh but comics and even animation to some degree again it takes it's just a long process with comics i'm writing things that will be out in three months four months and so the and and it's really not mucked around with that much i mean i talk to my editor before i start we talk about basically the parameters of the story at this point they kind of trust me not to go off the rails too badly so the notes aren't terribly intrusive and and when they are they're good notes uh but there's not many of them and there you go suddenly my script is is uh drawn by an excellent artist and i get to see it on the stands and it's all, all, always at least 99% of what I had envisioned. Ah, excellent. That's, the, that's to me is the, like the biggest perk of it is you're able to just see stuff. The other, I mean, the other perk of being a comic book professional uh, at a certain level is being able to go to conventions, being able to go to store signings and conventions and being flown out and seeing different cities and seeing different, you know, countries. I've been all over the world doing this stuff. And the fans are always super pleasant. The reception is always good. Uh, it You get to be famous for a weekend, and then you get to go back home to your normal life where you're not at all famous, which keeps your ego in check. But that's also a, a big perk. All right. I can understand that. I can understand that. Well said, good sir. Uh, more questions coming in from our friends here on the chat. Dave Manley uh, asks, is there a character or a property that you haven't worked on yet, but that you'd love to work on? I That one's a tough one because in comics, I've done everything. I mean, I've real, there's not much I haven't dabbled with. And those few characters that I have not done anything with, like Wonder Woman or Thor, are, are good characters that I respect, but I just have no take on those characters at all whatsoever. So you'd have to go outside the field of comics. I would love to write a Lone Ranger story. I would love to write a Doc Savage story because I was a big fan of Doc Savage in the 70s. Uh, and the Lone Ranger, there's not much meat on those bones, to be honest. It's a fairly thin character, but there's just something about the iconic nature of that character that draws me to, to that. Oh man, sign me up for all that. Yeah. I would totally, totally read that uh, to be sure. That is fantastic. Uh, Mamina Books and Games, also known as David V. Mamina asks, which of your comic runs was your favorite? Wow. it. I know this sounds like a wishy-washy answer, but it does change from, from day to day. But I'm really proud of what we accomplished in Daredevil with Paolo Rivera and Chris Somney and me and, and what we were able to put together. Uh, it felt like it had a beginning, a middle, and an end as far as runs go. I'm really very fond of the run I did with Michael Ringo on the Fantastic Four. I recently reread some of that stuff for the first time in, you know, 15 years. And <laughs> I kept reading it going, where is this Mark Wade today? Come on. Where, you know, he, this guy's witty. Where is this guy? Um, and I'm looking at my shelf. What else we got? Um, Flash, obviously, that was that was so much fun to do because I came on to on board flash at a time just after they'd canceled the nineties TV show and the feeling around the office. And this is the God's honest truth. The feeling around the DC offices was, you know, books selling. Okay. But why don't we just cancel it? Because, you know, nobody knows what to do with it. And editor Brian Augustine said, hold the phone and called me up and the, the rest is history. So we managed to save that book. I did not know that. That is fascinating. 
Real fascinating stuff. Thank you for answering that individual's question. Uh, Din has another one. He says, lots of people think that Steve Rogers' ending in Avengers Endgame is out of character. What's your opinion about this controversial moment? How is this controversial? How is he spent his entire life serving his country, serving people, defending the universe from galactic threats? He deserves some time to himself. He deserves a reward. He deserves a happy ending. I guess the controversy is if he went back in time as a young man, why didn't he keep fighting crime in the 40s and 50s and 60s? Uh, But, you know, we don't know that he didn't. We know he didn't do it as Captain America, but we don't, that's their loophole that they get. We don't know what Steve Rogers was doing all those years that he had a second chance through that period of time he could have been working for S.H.I.E.L.D. He could have been doing any number of things that didn't involve throwing a, a Frisbee around. That's a good point. It's a very good mm-hmm. point because we don't – I mean, that, that him going back and returning things to the way they were, it happens so quickly. Yeah. We don't know much of anything no, no, that happened. Know. We just see him sitting on the bench. Right. He could have yeah. been doing anything during that time. I, yeah. I, would, I would assume so, and I would agree with that too. So yeah. I, there you go. You know, uh, to each their own, as they say. I mean, if you're uh, looking for a way to bring Chris Evans yeah. back in the Marvel Universe, that's the way to do it, right? As you do some flashback to the 1960s with Peggy Carter or something, and then suddenly you realize, oh, my God, that's that's young Chris Evans in 1972 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, it's Chris Evans, Haley Atwell, two of the most well-known actors on the planet. I got no yeah. problem with them. So they want to do it, bring it back. Haley Atwell right. seems to be enjoying herself. Why the heck sure. not? You know, she's kicking tail and taking knee, doing that ever, pretty much ever since she started in film and television. And, and Haley, your resume is quite impressive. Let's just yeah. say that. Uh, King Arthur 2023 says, Mark, you should write what is known as a <laughs> creeper book. Um, look out for Shazam issue nine. Oh, boy. I guess that's where we're going with that. Creep yeah, because I, really, I think that the captain and the creeper make just the weirdest team up team. So that's why I put them together in that issue. Ah, eh, good to know. Good to know. Because I'm thinking, what, Creeper this, Creeper that? There's a couple of characters I may know that are called Creeper or Jeepers Creepers. I don't know. Uh, too many characters to keep track of. But on the flip side of the coin, though, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges about being a comic book writer? Uh, the ideas, fresh ideas, new ideas. It's re- Especially when you're working in the superhero arena. I mean, I, I love throwing the statistic out because it's absolutely true. There have been more stories told about Batman than about any other character in literature of all time. I mean, yes, Hercules has been around longer, but how many Hercules stories are there really? You know, how many, how many stories of the Olympic gods are there really? There's not even that many Sherlock Holmes stories, even though fans keep cranking them out. There have been so many Batman stories told that coming up with a new angle and a new take is really difficult. Uh, Superman, much the same. It's, you know, and, and there's a, a gap of Superman comics. I've read every Superman comic, but there's a you know a gap in the late '90s, early 2000s where I really wasn't paying so much attention that I remember that stuff very closely. So I will often find myself coming up with, I, with I, what I think is a good original idea and realize that you know Dan Jurgens and Carl Kiesel did it back in you know 1997 or whatever. So that is to me the the single biggest challenge is. Where do those new ideas, those new takes, those new hooks come from? Very tough challenge. Man, more yeah. stories written about Batman than there were written about Spider-Man? Amazing. Oh, by far. Oh, by far. Yes. Wow. I didn't know Batman beat Spider-Man to the punch when it comes to a certain well, Guinness Book of World Records. For- well, first off, he has a, you know, remember, he's got like a 25-year well, lead yeah. time. A right. jump, yeah. It's a 25, you've got 25 years on him. And also, again, you know, Spider-Man appears in a bunch of books, but every third comic DC publishes a Batman book these days. So yeah. anyway, that's fair. Yeah, you're right. Always good to be fact. I mean, I knew, I knew Batman has had a longer run respectively than Spider-Man, but at the same time, Spider-Man has been, has been so popular right. for so long. I'm thinking how many stories are there left? Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. I, I would say with reinventing it's a now. character that's been around for six decades and Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman's case, eight decades. Yep. yep. Jeez, it's a lot of history. But you know what is in history is the present, which this present episode of And I Quote with the icon, yes, the icon, I said it right, 
Mr. Mark Way, don't forget to like and share this with everyone you know. If you have any questions for our guests, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Be more than happy to take those as they come in respectively. Let's see here. I think one just came in. Oh, yes. kal of all people, says, Not bad. Okay. who's your favorite <laughs> Superman artiste and why, and why is it Kurt, Kurt Swan? Swan? Yes. I Look, it's Kurt was he's, – he's my favorite in part because he's the first one I knew. That's really a huge part of it. My first exposure to Superman – was World's Finest number 160, which was a Kurt Swan, George Klein jam. And that set the tone for me. Kurt, Kurt's magic was the humanity that he brought to characters, that the characters looked powerful and yet never absurd or too cartoony. Uh, there was just a real warmth and character and humanity he brought to Superman that I don't think has really been rivaled since then. The work is not terribly visually exciting i'll give you that it was in 1968 but not so much you know compared to today but the fundamentals of drawing the fundamentals of storytelling it's all there i mean kurt is phenomenal every anchor i've ever spoken to even younger guys who work with very late kurt's one stuff just every one of them was like I, you know, I wasn't sure but then i got the pages and i realized oh my god this guy could draw rings around anybody oh amazing amazing yeah. amazing amazing thank you for sharing that with us uh, dave manley uh poses the question uh which departed comic creator would you mm. most like to work with again oh marty pasco marty pasco was a writer for dc in the 70s 80s 90s uh marty was the guy who the single creator i think who taught me the most about how to approach stories and it became and it was before i even became a professional it was one of my favorite comics of all time action comics 500 which is the life story of superman as told by superman and there's a scene it's kurt swan uh terribly inked by frank Schiermonte. Ju julie schwartz was the editor and julie julie's one big weakness is he couldn't pick anchors to save his life um but there's a page in that story where he's recounting his history, Superman is. And he's talking about the day that Crypto the Super Dog arrived on Earth. And it's not treated silly. It's not treated goofily. It's treated as, you know, what a wonderful moment that was for him as a boy because for the first, he was alone. He was so alone for the first 15, 16 years of his life with no one else in the universe, even remotely like him, that he knew of. And then here comes crypto and suddenly he has something to share someone to share things with and the, the line of dialogue that marty wrote that still stays with me is suddenly he he was beside somebody who knew how the wind felt blowing through your face as you're flying through the air or the sound that bullets make when they bounce off living flesh and that more than anything taught me that the secret to unlocking these stories and these characters is to get inside that skin get inside that costume really think about those characters from the inside out and not just what they do and how they behave or how they see the world when they're fighting stuff or in conflict but what is their life like on a daily basis how how would your life be on a moment-to-moment -moment ordinary basis if you had x-ray vision if you had heat vision if you could fly through the air if you had radar sense if you had a magic lasso what you know what are the you know as a human being how would you react to having those things what would you do with them those are the questions that spur me on and that's what you know that that was what i learned from marty i would love to work with marty again because there's god only knows how much more i could learn from him incredible simply incredible great stuff great stuff thank you for sharing that sure. uh, with us definitely you know you're throwing all these titles of certain issues featuring certain characters i cannot wait to go back and read these there's some really good stuff here i tell you let me just put a an asterisk on the creator i'd like to work with again because mm -hmm. there's another one there's a there's an artist nobody knows him in the states his name is mink Oosterveer, uh swedish artist uh, I worked with him on a series I did with Boom Studios back in the early 2000s called The Unknown, which was not a superhero book, which was a story about uh, 
detective, a female detective, brilliant, uh, realizes that she has a brain tumor. It's terminal. She's going to die. And now she is out to use her detective skills to try to figure out exactly what happens to you after you die. Because there's so many theories and there's so many, you know, people think they know. And so all of those adventures then lead to bigger adventures, you know, investigating uh, a, a couple of brothers who claim that they have found a way to measure the weight of the human soul turns into a crime story when one kills the other. And it's a big thing. So I work with Mink on this one. It was the unknown. And then we did a sequel called uh, the unknown, the devil made flesh. That's what it was called. And I love doing those series. I love those characters that I was working on. And unfortunately, right after we finished the second series, Mink is a young guy and he died in a tragic motorcycle accident, a freak accident. And I lost my friend Mink. I lost a collaborator. But I also, at that point, put those characters aside forever because it just doesn't feel right to do more with those characters without Mink at my side. So I do miss Mink on so many levels. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your your, your yeah. collaborator, your friend there. Uh, thoughts and prayers go out to their yeah. friends and family for sure. Uh, but thank you for uh, sharing those names with us and all that wonderful uh, information there in that jazz. So I want to take a trip to a place called Memory Lane uh, okay. for a moment here, if you don't mind. Quite familiar uh, with it. This is one of the one of the highest selling graphic novels of all time. It's got legions of characters in it. So it just happens to be the one th the one graphic novel. I mean, there's many, but the graphic novel that got me personally, I can't speak for everybody, but my experience in comics, this is what made me a fan. And I thought to myself, if this is the way stories can be told in this kind of way, just take all my money because I'm already yeah. more like this. So Kingdom Come, which is heard of, of it, course, heard of it. I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah I've heard. I'm sure you, you may have. Mm -hmm. And it's written by you with artwork done by the incredible uh, icon and legend himself known as Alex Ross. Right. So I'm just curious, how did this all come together? And how does it feel when you found out that this is one of the highest selling graphic novels of all time? Uh, to answer your second question first, you know, we had no idea going into it. We knew that there would be some heat on it because Alex had come off a series called Marvels at Marvel, which did extremely well and was very well received. So we knew there'd be some heat to it, but you know, no one could have predicted that this thing would still be in print and still be a hot seller and still be so influential after all these years. It really began with Alex. I mean, I've said this over and over again, that it coming off of Marvels, which was a chance really for Alex to paint everyone in the Marvel universe he liked. He came over to DC and he had some ideas about, you know, the basic concept was Alex's. What if the modern heroes retired and there was a period of time passed and then the younger heroes came to, to the forefront, but without the moral and ethical guidance of the older heroes, everything just turns into a big WWE wrestling match between everybody. And there's no, thought to human human beings and no thought to humanity uh so with that springboard you know and and a bunch of different character sketches and takes on characters uh that were really interesting the specter in particular we just went to town we we got together many times we had you know many many long deep discussions about the plot and what to do with this and what wesley dodd's role would be and what his you know, what, what Norman McKay's role would be, Norman being based on Alex's dad. I mean, visually based, you know, and his name is Norman and he's a minister. So Alex just used that part of the graphic novel to pay homage to his own father. Uh, so from there, it was really just bad, bad, yeah, batting ideas back and forth, sending Alex pages, getting copies of pencils back, being amazed, you know, a, a real collaboration. And what a collaboration it turned out to be. Yeah, I, I got to say, I mean, again, if you love that book, I appreciate the fact that you enjoy the story. But without Alex, there's no king. If that had been drawn by, yeah. you know, Kurt Swan, even nobody would nobody would remember it today. It's it's memorable because of Alex. Absolutely. And Dave Manley actually says uh, Alex Ross brings characters to life. Oh, in yeah. All, in all caps. Yeah. So. There you go, Dave, Dave Manley. Uh, Azan, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Azan goes on to say, uh, do you have any favorite Superman villains who were mostly forgotten after the events of Crisis? I like the Trox a lot. 
I like I like Vatrix a lot. I like Amalak, who was a, a little known Superman villain, who had a grudge against Kryptonians because his planet was inadvertently destroyed along with the destruction of Krypton. Uh, I love Grax, who is a four-armed alien being who is even smarter than Brainiac, who is very little threat, but I just like that character. Uh, Superman's the biggest challenge with Superman is that his bench of villains is not very deep. Uh, there's a lot of low stakes villains like the prankster and the toy man. Uh, not much to be done there. Uh, you really have a very limited pool of really great villains to draw from parasite, Metallo, Luther, Brainiac, Mitch's Um, I don't know if there's anybody I've forgotten, but those that's my answer to the question there's a couple of those that i would like to revisit and bring back that's fascinating we'd love to see that happen at some yeah. point uh a, another page in the trip down memory lane if you will into the galaxy far far away ah uh, yes uh, print star wars princess leia more specifically mm -hmm. now unfortunately carrie fisher's no longer with us but i will say this book was really well done and Thank it you. made me it made us as an audience realize, hey, there were things that happened between these different movies yeah. and different iterations of these characters. It's not just or blue milk at the cantina all day. So right. what was your experience like going into the galaxy far, far away with Star Wars? It was it was really interesting in that it began the same way that only a few of my assignments have begun. Fantastic Four is another example of a time when someone came to me with, hey, would you like to do this? And my immediate response was not interested because I don't have a take on that. I have really no interest. And and I and, in Star, and, and with Fantastic Four, clearly it worked out. Clearly I managed to find a take. But with Star Wars, I'm a fan, but I'm not an uber fan. I'm, I had no ambition of writing Star Wars stories. I really had no thoughts along those, those lines. Um, I, but the assignment came, would you like to do this? And I, again, I said the same thing. I really, I don't have a, a hook. I'm, I'm not, I will do my best work when I'm passionate about an idea rather than just writing for a paycheck. And then I made the mistake of going off and thinking about it. And I realized that the piece that is missing from the original Star Wars movie, and again, it's missing because it's not an eight hour movie. You know, there's not room to address everything, but Leia watched her entire planet be destroyed before her very eyes and doesn't get a chance to deal with, we never get a chance to see her deal with that, react to that, mourn for those people, you know, uh, deal with her feelings about what that ha what happened, what do you do next? Is it, You're the princess of nothing all of a sudden. So that was the hook that got me into the story, princess of nothing. What do you do? Uh, you go search the rest of the galaxy for other survivors of your planet and then hopefully you're able to to do something put together rebuild that society even in a small way somehow and preserve the culture preserve the the history of your of your of your people uh and have a wild adventure along the way so that was the that was the take there and i was so lucky to be working with the dodsons uh terry and rachel dodson the artists who so brought that to life and i was also lucky in that it was early enough in the whole Star Wars relaunch where the studios were pretty lenient about what they were giving notes on. So first issue, almost no notes. Second issue, a couple more notes. By the fifth issue, it was like a lot of notes from the studio, but that's okay. You know, it's their sandbox. It's their toys. I get it. But I was at least for the first few issues, it was extremely enjoyable because I didn't have the burden of, 18 million executives telling me what to do. Yeah, you didn't have the uh, the people behind the scenes and the creative control saying, "Hey, it's got to be done this way. You can't do right. it that way." It's like, look, if I, you know, if you want to tell a story, just tell a story and enjoy the ride. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's how I feel personally. But yeah. then again, you know, when you work for the big two, if it's Marvel or DC, there's there are overlords and there are things that you get right. And again, you there, you know, you're just here, you're borrowing yeah. the toys, you know, you're just a visitor. You got to be respectful and mindful of the fact that 
these characters existed before you. They will exist after you. You were a caretaker. You don't get to blow them up so big that nobody else can ever play with them again. That's just irresponsible and, and unfair. Yeah, it's totally fair. You can see both sides of the fence there. Uh, kal of all people, has a question. Uh, thoughts yeah. on Superman sporting a mullet? <sighs> Please. I Look, everybody makes bad decisions now and then, even Superman. Yeah, no mullet for him. I it was a dark time. It was a very dark time. It was, it, was the it was the only editorial note we got on Kingdom Come that we really resisted and lost, which was at that time, really? Superman had a mullet in the regular comics. And since we were doing, even though it was an alternate world, even though it was an else world, it just, it was still the mandate from the Superman office. No, no, no. He must have a mullet. So if you look at those pages with younger Superman, you'll see how Alex worked so hard to make sure that Superman was always posed in a way where you didn't have to deal much with his mullet. Wow. Yeah. So much for the whole uh, style of choice known as mullet where it says business in the front and party in the back. Not so right. much. Not so much. Not so much. Absolutely not. Uh, let's see. Dave Manley says Superman with a mullet, earth in the front, and Krypton, Krypton in the, the back. back. Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it there, Dave. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, speaking of, let's take a bit of a grittier and darker take on these characters. So mm -hmm. Tower of Babel, goodness yeah. gracious. You want to talk about destruction, craziness, and the dark night in the center of it all. How crazy and awesome was this experience working on the Tower of Babel? It was great. I mean, again, I, I one of those moments when I had the basic idea of – those first few pages of Bruce Wayne visiting his parents' grave, only graves only to find that they had been dug up and excavated and the bodies were nowhere to be found. I had that idea like a year before I even had a chance to do Tower of Babel. And I just would read Batman comics every month after that, praying that no one got to that idea first. So that opened the story. Uh, the rest of the story, it's a, it's a good story. I'm happy with it. Um, I, I'm not thrilled with what we birthed out of what, what, it, you know, what came after people. I think so a lot, some writers took the wrong lesson out of tower of Babel, which is Batman's an asshole, which I don't buy into at all. And I think too many people, and this is my fault as a writer, too many people got the wrong idea. Batman's sin in this story, Batman's bad move was not that he came up with contingency plans against the other justice leaders. Totally makes sense. Totally get it. His crime was that he didn't tell the justice leaders that he was busy doing this. If he had just said, hey, just Superman, just so you know, make you feel better. If you got it, if you ever go nuts, I got you covered. Everything's fine. That's why the Justice League was pissed, not because Superman was coming up with these master plans against them, because, you know, he didn't bother to tell anybody and they got stolen by Ra's al Ghul and suddenly the Justice League is in serious trouble. Fair point, fair point. Yeah, I don't think of Batman as an a-hole. He's just a strategist. He's there. When you take Batman to the extreme of being cold and, you know, distant and so forth, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, this, is, this gets back to a question I'm often asked is, you know, Superman and Batman, friends or enemies. And my answer is always, look, Batman is a strategist. If forgetting the human factor, forgetting the fact that he's also a you know, a, a, he has a human side. Batman's a strategist. There is no strategy in making an enemy out of the most powerful man in the world. There is no strategy in making enemies when you could be making friends because you're all working toward the same purpose. Right on, man. Right on. <laughs> Fair, uh, fair point. King Arthur, uh, two, is it two? Oh, I'm sorry. King Arthur 2003, not 2023. Good Lord. Right. Says, what is your opinion on the chained? And do you plan to write him in any future books? I have to respectfully pass on the question because it gives too much away. Next. Ah, all good. No problem mm -hmm. there. So uh, you we covered that corner, but you know, just to cover another corner, the greatest of all time, also known as the goat. What was it like ah, putting together yeah. Birthright for the Man of Steel, known as Superman? That was a blast. My favorite thing I ever wrote. I mean, it really is. I mean, not, there's a lot of things I've written that I'm really proud of, but this one is my love letter to Superman. It is my chance to really dig into 
the question of if you're retelling that origin in the 21st century, what do you have to do with that character to make it feel contemporary? Uh, what do you have to do to make it feel vital again? And how do you address things that made sense in 1938 that don't necessarily make much sense in the 21st century? Like, you know, how does a rocket get past NORAD? That kind of stuff. So I was able to build on that. I'm very proud of the work that Laniel, you and I did, Jerry Allen Guilin doing the inks, uh, Dave McKay doing the colors, really happy with the way that came out. They just recently reissued it in a deluxe hardcover that is beautiful. It's a beautiful, it's the best looking version of this story. So I encourage people to go out and look for this. I'm very proud of Birthright. I'll have to go out and get that edition of it then. Yeah. Add it to my Superman. Well, in this case, my graphic novel shelf full of full of other characters and other books and other writers and yeah. artists and inkers as well. But yeah, Birthright's definitely a heck of a story there. There's no question about it. What else is super is this episode of And I Quote with the icon known as Mark Wade. Don't forget to like and share this with everyone you know. If you have any questions for the esteemed gentleman known as Mark Wade, let us know in the comments. Right. Let us know in the chat. Be more than happy to take and, those. As they, as and type can. quickly because we've got about five, ten minutes to go. So before the clock runs out for me. So by all means, if you got your questions, get them in now. Ah, fair point, fair point. Well, then I'll uh, rapid fire with this one. Mm -hmm. Irredeemable. Uh, yeah. So if, if, so if a fictional character goes nuts, loses his mind, we got a situation here and we need to go to DEF CON 5 and get some help. What was your experience writing Irredeemable? I mean, the basic take was easy because everybody's done it. What if Superman turned evil? What if Superman were a bad guy? I didn't much care about the surface of that. It that, just doing a story about what if Superman was evil? Oh, he uses heat vision to kill people. That's easy. That's low hanging fruit. That is, that's just cheap. What was interesting to me was being able to dive deeper into that, which is what makes a Superman like character good? What makes them evil? Is it nature versus nurture? Why, if someone would turned that way, why would he turn that way? Getting deep into those characters heads. That was the fun part of it for me. And I, Again, had a great time working on that. Peter Kraus was a terrific collaborator. And I'm very happy that that, that story seems to have hold up, seems to, seems to have held up over the years. Rock on, man. Rock on. Any special memories for you from being at conventions or other events, whether you're there as a vendor or there as an attendee that stand out? I'm trying to think. I mean, there, most of them are good memories, which is nice. Um, you know, I, I fans are 99.9% .9 of the time pleasant to deal with. They're, every once in a while, they'll bring little gifts or something, which is very nice. Every once in a while, they'll bring big gifts that I can't get back in my suitcase, and I just have to smile and tell them thank you. Um, yes, I, mean, I think one of my favorite memories of a convention is being at uh, the Mole convention in Mexico City. This is many years ago. Uh, and while we were sitting there, it was, you know, he went from table to table, this guy, uh, as the artist or the writer was sitting there doing autographs, the guy would bring out a lump of clay and then he would sit there at the edge of your table and very quickly carve out a bust of you in clay. And it looked great. I mean, it was, this guy was incredibly talented. I, that was a great experience, just watching this guy make my face out of clay. And, and when you're done, you're taking it with you. It's, you know, you've cured it. It is, it is, it's like a Columbo weapon. You can kill somebody with this thing. Um, that was, that was one of my absolute favorite moments of the convention. Talk about personalized experience. Uh, yeah. Din asked, I saw a while ago that Netflix is adapting Irredeemable. Is this still happening? I, fingers crossed, as far as I know. But again, the, the strike not only did the strikes, the various strikes postpone everything in Hollywood to some degree, it also set certain projects back to square one. I don't know if Irredeemable was one of those. That's one of the things I want to try to find out in the next month or so. But, you know, a lot of the deals that were made before the strikes no longer hold in place. So I'm, I'm hoping that it's still in play. I know that I've talked to the director. I've talked to the writer. I love their take and we can only hope. Boy, that would be a sight to see. Uh, last yeah. question from the audience. Tomato Shrek says, Mark, what is your opinion on the character of Hank Pym? He's personally one of my favorite Marvel characters, and I would love to see you write a story about him one of these days. Well, sir, you need to read, uh, was it the Age of Ultron uh, spinoff that I did with Hank Pym? I did, a, I did a Hank Pym story. 
and I'm really happy with it. It was basically, why is Hank Pym this way? What made him a scientist as a kid? What goes on in his head? I ignore the, oh my God, I mean, poor Hank Pym. The, the, ruined, ruined in one moment by one bad miscommunication between an artist and a writer where the artist, where the writer said, you know, Hank is mean to Jan Pym. And then the artist decided to, you know, show Hank backhanding her. This is 40 years ago. And this still defines the character for most people. So I don't think Hank will ever be fully redeemable in comics because he's just so canceled by that moment. Uh, and so defined by that moment. But boy, you know, if you take that out of the equation, I really dig that character a lot. So Age of Ultron, I think issue 10.1, maybe you can look for it. Well, there you go. Well, we want to respect our guests time. So thank you, Mark Wade, for being with us on this episode of NX. This has been an honor, a privilege, a pleasure, good sir. We appreciate you being here with us and taking some time out of your busy schedule for the person watching or listening to this where can they follow you on social media to keep up the incredible things showing uh, let's see we can find me at markwade.com you can find me on blue sky mark wade uh you can find me on facebook for those of you who are over 50 is mark wade um and then you know you can't find me on twitter anymore because like most people i have run screaming from that hell hole dumpster fire uh that's where you can find me right now and then if I, you know, I also want to plug something while I'm here. I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, but uh, Howard Chaikin and I, <clears throat> Howard Chaikin, of course, brilliant and storied artist writer of the, who has been in the industry since I was old enough to go, oh boy, I, I hope I can be like Howard Chaikin someday. Uh, he and I are teaching a class at UCLA next Saturday. So if you're in the California area and you're interested in an all day seminar, talking about how to create comics from start to finish. It's Howard, it's me, it's an artist named Christian Gossett going to come in. We've got other other special surprises happening. It's an all-day thing. Uh, you can visit uh, sevenlafayette.com. If you go to markwade.com, there's, there's more information. If you go to markwade at Blue Sky, there's a lot more information about this. If you're in the California area and you want to come and, and attend, uh, you are more than welcome to come. Well, thank you, kind sir. Do appreciate you being here and taking time out of your day to speak with us and with you who may be watching or listening to this. Thank you uh, for doing so, Mark. I'm going to talk to you here in just one moment here. My name is Ryan of Neuroculture. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RyanRPM5. Check out all the incredible things we're doing on our YouTube channel. We got movie anniversary watch alongs. We got the Nerdy Cantina talking Star Wars every week on Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern time. We got the Meaning of Phantom is going to be on Friday, November the 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And we got a great lineup of special guests for that episode. So definitely check out all the wonderful things we are doing. We're this close to hitting 1,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. Once we do, we're going to go through a great big live stream uh, celebration. It's going to include returning favorites, some special guests, and some special giveaways that include 11 by 17 prints provided by our good friend, The Art of John Pinto on Instagram and Facebook, such as this print featuring the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Vader. You got that one. Also, you got the wall-crawling menace known as Spider-Man going up against the Green Goblin uh, here, so you can win things like that. We also got prints from Doctor Who, Star Trek, all your favorite fandoms, all that great stuff. You're going to be eligible to win that, but only if we reach a 1,000 subscribers. We're going to need your help on that. So tell your friends about us. Tell your friends, your family, the coworkers, all that good stuff. Thank you for being here. Like, comment, share, subscribe, ring that bell to be notified when our new videos go up or they go live. And remember, life is better when reading comics. Take a look. Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida is leading the way in pop culture fun. From comic books and graphic novels to Funko Pops and collector's items, Famous Faces and Funnies has it all. Rick Shea and the professional team at Famous Faces and Funnies are friendly and knowledgeable. Whether you're looking for toys, props, collector treasures, or a new comic book, Famous Faces and Funnies is your one-stop shop. To find Famous Faces and Funnies on Facebook and Twitter, just type at F. FF Comics. You've worked hard and written a great book. Now it's time to give it a great cover. If you're an indie author or small press publisher, Plasma Fire Graphics is your source for affordable cover illustration and graphic design.
Plasma Fire Graphics, when the look of your book matters to you. Good morning! Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Ha, <laughs>